Good evening, and welcome to the Athenaeum Symposia, the Frank Islam Athenaeum Symposia at the Germantown campus. We're really excited to see you here. I am Joan Nake, English professor and director of the Athenaeum Symposia speaker series. And without you, we could not really have these events. Uh, we're very, very excited. And as you know, it's called the Athenaeum Symposia. Uh, and of course, it's for the Greek goddess of wisdom, Athena. And I'd like to share with you just for a moment other words that mean wisdom. According to the Oxford Dictionary, synonyms for wisdom are discernment, insight, perception, perceptiveness, perceptivity, sagaciousness, sagacity, sageness, and sapience. I am sure tonight we are going to engage in sagacity and sapience. We are going to learn a great deal of wisdom from Dr. Daycake, who is an incredible speaker and incredibly knowledgeable about women in Islam. Um, by the way, I would like to introduce Lisa Clark from the library, who is going to have the honor and the privilege of introducing Dr. Daycake. Welcome, my name is Lisa Clark and I am a reference librarian here at uh, the Germantown Montgomery College Libraries. This past year, Montgomery College Libraries was honored by the National Endowment for the Humanities as well as the American Library Association with a collection of titles of, of books uh, and DVDs called the Bridging Cultures Bookshelf Muslim Cultures, um, Muslim Journeys, excuse me. These titles were meant to be the foundation of scholarship-based programs like this one to help the public learn and to discuss uh, more about the Muslim community, um, their beliefs, their customs, their history and culture. Muslim women are the topic of many of these books. In particular, we have three books that we'll be um, giving away actually today. Dreams of Trespass by Moroccan writer um, Fatima Mernisi, Leila Ahmed's A Quiet Revolution, Persepolis by Marjane Sartrapi. All of these books um, in some ways touch upon the options that are available to Muslim women in their communities, the choices that they make for themselves, as well as um, their role in society. We're fortunate today to have Dr. Maria J. Cake who is the Associate Professor and Chair of the Religious Studies Program at George Mason University to help us talk about some of these issues. Um, Dr. Daycake received her PhD from uh, Princeton um, in the Near Eastern Studies. She's a founding member and director of the Interdisciplinary Islamic Studies Program at George Mason University. Her research interests and publications lie in the fields of Islamic intellectual history with a particular interest in Shiite and Sufi traditions, Quran commentary, and relig women's religious experience. She's written a book, The Charismatic Community, Shiite Identity in Early Islam, which was published by Sunni Press in 2008. Dr. Daycake has published several articles on women's spirituality in Islam, and this coming spring, Harper Collins will publish Study Quran, which is a collaborative project for which she served as associate editor. Please help me welcome our very prestigious speaker, Dr. Maria Daycake. Good evening. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you, Joan. Thank you all for coming. It's wonderful to see everyone here. I'm very happy to be speaking on this subject, I'm very happy to be speaking here and as part of the Bridging Cultures Muslim Journeys project, which I think is an amazing uh, project and one that uh, I think will end up being very important. All right, uh, so speaking about women in Islam is a huge topic. I teach an entire course at George Mason on women in Islam and we still don't really finish Usually the last three weeks, I kind of squish into the last class somehow. As you know, it's a big topic because there is a, a very large Muslim population in the world. There's about 1.2 billion 
Muslims in the world spread over um, all of the continents, uh, all of the major continents. There's 45 Muslim majority countries. Uh, one in five human beings is on the planet is Muslim, and of course, uh, it's a very diverse population. It's uh, there. There are Muslims in all parts uh, of the world. Does anyone know? Uh, I, I hear from Lisa that you get a book if you answer, if you ask a question. Maybe if you answer correctly. Uh, what is the most populous Muslim country? Yes. Indonesia. We have our first winner. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and of course, now we know there are also substantial Muslim minority populations in Europe and North America as well. Uh, and as I said, there's tremendous diversity. There, wherever Islam went, of course, Islam begins in Arabia, what we know today is Saudi Arabia. It moves into the central lands of the Middle East and out from there toward Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, into Southeast Europe. Uh, into Central Asia, into the subcontinent, and finally into Southeast Asia. And wherever Islam went, it really adapted itself to the local culture. So the, of course, the religious principles, the religious texts, those things remain standard across the board and in fact contributed very much to the success of the Islamic world. You could travel from India to Morocco with one language and one currency. Uh, and one set of rules that you knew, so it, it was great for trade. Uh, but in terms of things like, th things that we're going to be talking about tonight, social culture, uh, dress, architecture, art, those things adapted very much to the context in which Islam found itself. So we see different Islamic cultures, you might say, um, in India, in uh, the Middle East, in Iraq, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in France, in the United States. It's also a bit of a difficult topic to talk about because, of course, there are a lot of um, um, preconceptions, a lot of misconceptions about women in Islam. Um, everyone knows that there are five pillars in Islam. I often say people tend to think that there's also this extra sixth one, which was that Muslims have to oppress women. Uh, and so uh, there's already this perception that Muslim women are oppressed, that they don't have choices, that they don't have agency, uh, that, uh, that, that the Muslim world is particularly oppressive and um, um, does not value women, and this is not... Uh, true, it's certainly not entirely true, it's not true across the board, uh, and uh, so I hope to bring some of that to light this evening. Because there are so many negative misconceptions, when you're trying to inform people, you're usually trying to point out to them all of the things that they miss and that don't make it into our media images, and so t sometimes uh, you're, uh, it feels like you're um, uh, always trying to present a very positive uh, image, and what I'm really trying to do is balance things and try to give you a very balanced view of, of Islam. All right, so I'm going to begin, even though I want to talk about uh, Muslim women in contemporary times, I also want to um, begin by talking about uh, what it says in the Quran about women and women's issues. Uh, most of you probably know that the Qur'an is the scripture for Muslims. It is their scripture. It is a scripture that they hold particularly dear. Muslims consider the Qur'an to be the direct word of God, so not just the meaning, but the very words, the very sounds that the Qur'an has within it are considered to be sounds that God has spoken, uh, his very words. And for that reason, Muslims are not very open to criticisms of, of the Qur'an, in a, exploring the Qur'an, certainly asking questions of it, uh, but not uh, criticisms of the validity or the authenticity or, or uh, the originality of the Qur'an. So it's something that they hold very, very sacred. So what does the Qur'an say about women? Well, when we look at what the Qur'an says about God, one of the things that we might note is that the Qur'an never calls God Father. In fact, Muslims never refer to God as Father, not even metaphorically. And there are a lot of reasons for this. Islam emerges in a culture where, in, in Arabia, where the Arabs of Arabia prior to the coming of Islam considered God to have daughters, for example. 
um, Muslims in the very early period were aware of Christians and Christian uh, notions of Jesus as the Son of God, which the Quran does not uh, accept. But in general, it is not acceptable for Muslims to call God Father, and this is in some ways very significant. One of the things that Jewish and Christian feminist scholars have had to get over working within religious texts is the fact that God is associated with this image that is completely male. Right? Um, and that uh, is, is it simply will put, it will say it's not a burden um, for Muslims uh, looking at their scripture. Or we could take another story, which image here for that, um, miniature um, painting, uh, the story of Adam and Eve. So the Quran tells the story of Adam and Eve in a way that is largely similar to what you find in the book of Genesis. In the Bible, Adam and Eve are created, they're put in the garden, God tells them you can eat from any tree except this one, um, they eat from that one, uh, and they're banished. But there are some important differences in the Quranic account of the Adam and Eve narrative, which is told in several different places throughout the Quran. As you may know, in the biblical version, Eve is the one who is initially tempted by the serpent. Right? And um, the implication being, the serpent thought she was an easy target, right? So he, he tempts her first, and having succumbed to temptation, uh, she then becomes a temptress and tempts Adam. And when they discover what they've done and God confronts them, and God says to Adam, why did you do this? Adam says, the woman made me do it. And he turns to the woman, and the woman says, the serpent made me do it, right? Just passing the buck uh, along. And then, of course, they're banished from the garden, but not before very specific punishments are given to them, including the punishment for women of pain in childbirth. In the Quranic narrative, Adam and Eve are told together not to take from the tree. Together, simultaneously, they eat from the tree. When they're confronted by God, they simultaneously admit what they've done and immediately repent. God forgives them, although he does banish them from the garden, but without these punishments that, again, have often remained a kind of burden in, in, in Western Christian or Jewish uh, uh, feminist uh, narratives. The Quran contains another, a number of other very positive female figures. Mary, the mother of Jesus, has her own chapter in the Quran. There's a lot more about Mary in the Quran than there is in the Bible, just to give you a, an example. And Mary is a fairly heroic figure in the Quran. There's no Joseph, for those of you who are familiar, of course, with the Christian story. There's no Joseph to protect her, to lead her on her journey to act as cover for why she has this child. Uh, she has to go off by herself, give birth by herself, and answer the inevitable accusations by herself. All right. All right, so there are another, a number of other uh, uh, women, but we won't, we'll, we'll move on from there. And there, if there are questions, I can certainly take those uh, after. <clears throat> One of the things that the Quran does quite clearly is it establishes the spiritual equality between men and women. Because there's no priesthood in Islam, you have imams, of course, but imams are sort of first among equals. They're people who happen to know uh, um, quite a bit about the religion, but they don't have a, a priestly status. Uh, and all of the major rituals in Islam can be completed individually by either men or women. In other words, uh, women are not dependent upon men or upon a male hierarchy or male clergy to fulfill their religious duties. Uh, this is a very famous verse in the Quran from uh, Surah 33, 33rd uh, Surah of the Quran. I can see people squinting in the back, so I will read it to you uh, in case you can't uh, see. The verse reads, Verily, the Muslim men and the Muslim women, the believing men and the believing women, the obedient men and the obedient women, the truthful men and the truthful women, the patient men and the patient women, the humble men and the humble women, the men who give charity and the women who give charity, the men who fast and the women who fast, the men who guard their chastity and the women who guard their chastity, 
The men who remember God and the women who remember God often in their hearts and with their tongues, God has prepared for them forgiveness and a great reward. Now, I think one of the noticeable aspects of this uh, particular verse is the constant, almost pedantic way it continually says, right? Why not just say the Muslims and those who are believers and those who are obedient and those who are truthful, why not just be general in this way? Why make it so clear that it's men and women, men and women, men and women? And all of the qualities up here, they relate either to primary ritual practices that Muslims do or spiritual qualities and characteristics and virtues that they're supposed to acquire or particular social norms like guarding their chastity. Uh, why is it that this is equally uh, for men and women? And this verse was revealed to the prophet Muhammad uh, in response to a question actually posed to him by his wife. His wife, Umm Salama, noticed that the Qur'an always spoke in general terms and didn't seem to speak particularly to women. And she said to her husband, who was the founder of Islam, the Prophet Muhammad, why is it that God doesn't speak to us? Why doesn't he speak to us? Uh, and the Prophet Muhammad didn't say to her, oh, be quiet, of course he's speaking to everybody. What are you doing asking questions about why God reveals this and why God reveals that? He doesn't say anything. And a few hours later, when he went to lead the prayer, uh, this particular verse was revealed to him in answer, ultimately, uh, to his wife's question. So I think that this is uh, this verse, and there are other verses as well, I don't have time to uh, go through all of them, uh, that very clearly establish the idea that men and women have the same religious responsibilities, and they will have the same reward for fulfilling those responsibilities. Okay. As clear as the Qur'an is about the spiritual equality of men and women and that women are spiritually independent of their husbands, uh, one of the most important women in Islam is the wife of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh has to be the most evil man in the Qur'an. Um, and yet his wife is uh, considered to be one of the most saintly um, women who ever lived. So as clear as it is about this spiritual equality of men and women, the Quran also, as I think is well known, makes a social distinction between men and women. It sets up different roles for men and women, and it sets up also a hierarchy between men and women on the social plane. Right? And particularly within the context of marriage. So um, very famous um, and very controversial verse of the Quran in Surah 4 clearly establishes men as the head of the household. Right? It uh, uh, explains that men are the protectors and maintainers of women, that men have the responsibility to um, support women with their wealth, and this is a principle in Islamic law, uh, men are responsible for their wives, for their children, and to the extent they, that they need it for all of their female relatives. Right? So men are the ultimate providers, and in exchange for this, the Quran also um, gives them authority. It gives them authority over their wives, it asks women to be obedient to their husbands, and it also gives men permission to discipline their wives in certain circumstances. Right? So if we take all these things together, which is in this one verse, verse 34 of Surah 4, we can see that it, it clearly establishes a patriarchal structure that assumes male authority within the family to be normative. The Quran also says that in the context of discussing both marriage and divorce, that men have rights over women I'm sorry, women have rights over men, just as men have rights over women, but the men have a degree above them. And the, this, uh, the question is, what is this degree? The Quran all, often uses these very open-ended terms without a lot of uh, uh, definition. If you were to ask medieval commentators on the Quran, they would say, oh, I can tell you what the degree is that they have over women. Intelligence, rationality, strength, soundness of character, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I do think, personally, when you look at the verse, it's situated directly in the context of a discussion of marriage and divorce. And I think the degree 
relates to that, that men have a degree of freedom, a degree of authority, and uh, a degree of rights, you might say, within the marital context, that at the very least differs significantly from that uh, of women. You may know that the Quran establishes at the beginning of this same surah, surah 4, or chapter 4 of the Quran, it establishes the right of men to practice polygamy. I'm, I, I don't have the verse with me, but it is an interesting verse if you want to look it up. I'm sure you could pull out your iPhones and find it very quickly. Um, but uh, the, the, the verse uh, clearly establishes the possibility of polygamy, but interestingly, it does it in the, for the purposes of justice. It says, uh, if you cannot deal justly with the orphan girls, then marry the women that seem good to you, two, three, or four, which is the establishment of the limit of four uh, for Muslim men. But, the verse continues, if you cannot deal with them equally and equitably, then only marry one. Right? So the Quran clearly establishes this um, possibility of polygamy, and uh, it's, polygamy is something that is not widely practiced uh, in contemporary society, contemporary Muslim societies, but uh, it still is practiced. It, it does still exist, um, and certainly uh, as, as a possibility in most Muslim-majority countries. Uh, and finally, I mean, there are other things we can talk about, but try to be brief here. Um, finally, men have a, the, the Quran gives to men a unilateral right to divorce. So a, ma a man can divorce his wife uh, without cause, at will. Um, there are certain repercussions to him divorcing his wife, which we can talk more about if you want, but, um, but certainly that's a, that remains a possibility for men. All right, so in this sense, if we look at all of these things together, we can say that it's quite clear that the Quran uh, it emerges in a context that's patriarchal, right? When the, when, when the Quran emerges in the seventh century, practically the whole world is patriarchal in nature. Um, it, uh, it, it largely ratifies that patriarchy. It assumes it and it largely ratifies that, uh, that patriarchy. But it doesn't leave it untouched, and I think this is important. Uh, if you read the Quran carefully, you can see that it is trying to, to provide what I would call an amended patriarchy. That is a patriarchy that also establishes some rights that are very key and, and, and very important and have historically been very important uh, for Muslim women. So for example, as many of you know, the Quran established independent property rights for women. So, so even today, Muslim men and women, even if they're married, will typically keep their finances separate. Right? A woman, if you notice in this verse, it says men who, who give charity and women give charity. Men and women give charity separately on their own independent property. <clears throat> so uh, this, is a significant, this is a significant advantage. Uh, women didn't have property rights in marriage in this country until the early 20th century. When a woman got married, her property was absorbed by her husband. It became his property. And it was alienated from her in principle and became his. Uh, whereas women had these rights in the seventh century in the Islamic world. Now you might ask, in the seventh century, where did women get money? Right? Um, it's not like, you know, typically women went to college and they went out and got a job, you know, it didn't happen like that exactly. Um, but there were ways for women to, uh, to have their own personal property and acquire property, and that's also on the basis of rights that are given to them in the Quran. So uh, women in the Quran were given rights to inheritance. Right? They inherit from their relatives. And uh, it, seem, it would seem, if we were look at what the Quran says, that prior to the coming of Islam in Arabia, not only didn't women inherit, and the idea of women inheriting was considered absurd, uh, but they, uh, they were inherited. They could be inherited. So were their husband to die, uh, and this is very common in lots of tribal societies actually, if there were their husband to die, their brother, his brother could literally inherit her and sort of keep her reproductive power, you might say, within the family within the broader family. The Quran forbids inheriting women as if they're, mon their property, 
and in fact makes them heirs. And this was something that was really shocking for the community. When the, when the verse came down, um, giving women a share of inheritance, uh, some of the, the Prophet Muhammad's companions were like, really? You know, maybe you should, I mean like women like that can't carry swords and things, you're gonna give them money. Uh, maybe you should go back and ask God about that again. Maybe you heard it wrong, right? I mean, there was really this kind of, and it has to be repeated twice uh, in the Quran in response to these, these questions that came up. So that was one way that women would acquire money and the other way was through marriage. So the Quran requires that when a man marries a woman, he has to give her a sum of money or a piece of property that they agree on. And it has to be physical property, right? It can't be, you know, I promise to read you poetry every night for the rest of our marriage or something, which is lovely. And, and you can certainly ask for that, um, which is what I'm gonna get to, but, uh, but, but, but it has to be physical, tangible property. And again, um, how important, how big, how substantial that property would be would depend upon the social class uh, of the woman and the man who were getting married. It could be very substantial. Um, or it could be something that was more of a token. It could be jewelry, but it could also be um, large tracts of land, right, depending on, on the status of the people who were getting married. Let's see if I have, uh, okay. Um, one other uh, thing to mention is that marriage in Islam is a contractual relationship. That's not to say that it's limited to a business relationship, but it has a legal basis in a contract. And so when a man and a woman get married in Islam, they sign a kitab, uh, literally um, a, a piece of writing that states their marriage contract and the terms of their marriage. Those of you who might be familiar with the Jewish marriage custom, traditional Jewish marriage customs, you, you sign a ketubah, which comes from the same word. Um, and the marriage contract, of course, and these are several examples that I have here, the two on the top, well, the one on the top left and in the middle, of course, are um, medieval, very beautifully uh, ornamented and illustrated copies of, uh, of a marriage certificate, and then we have some modern examples um, here below. The marriage contract, besides stipulating um, you know, in a kind of general way, the responsibilities husband and wife have to each other. Uh, in the marriage contract, the wife is also allowed to add other conditions to her marriage, and it, if the potential groom accepts. And so there are spaces for the woman to write in uh, the terms of her marriage that she is asking for in her marriage, and only the bride writes additional uh, conditions. The groom doesn't write additional conditions. And this is what I'm talking about, I think, by amended patriarchy. On the one hand, there is the recognition of male authority, greater male power within the family, but there were also uh, traditions that develop, that, based in the Quran, that develop in Islamic law, that are meant to provide protections for women in this situation where they might be particularly vulnerable. So the marriage contract, uh, a woman, in, according to some, depends on the school of law, there's multiple schools of Islamic law, but some schools of law allow women to write in all kinds of things into their marriage contract. So a woman might write into her marriage contract that her husband's not allowed to take any additional wives, right? Should she worry that he was going to do that? She might write into the contract that she wants him to provide her with a college education that she wants him to allow her to work outside the home, that she wants to continue to reside in this city, that he needs to provide her with a house of a certain size or quality, right? It could be all kinds of, he needs to provide her with a certain amount of money every month. It could be all kinds of things, right? Or you could write nothing. I don't recommend that. I think if someone gives you a blank check, you, you write in whatever you can and, and, and you see if you can get away with it, right? Uh, but, but in any case, this is, uh, th this is uh, certainly something that is, that is possible. Okay, so, um, so this is sort of the situation of women within marriage. Within the family, more broadly, I would say that it's important to recognize that even though there is a kind of a hierarchy, a kind of hierarchy of husbands over wives, that's not necessarily, that unevenness isn't necessarily the case between mothers and fathers in relationship to their children. So um, many of you may know that mothers are, are very much validated in Islam, very valued, I should say, uh, in Islamic culture. 
uh, according to Islamic law, men and women have equal rights to have children. Right? In Islam, you can practice contraception, uh, but uh, you can't do it if your partner, if your marriage partner is opposed to it, whether it's the husband or the wife. Right? So if they both agree they're going to not have children or postpone having children, that's fine, but you can't deny. N neither party can deny that to the other. Uh, the Quran suggests that there should be a process of mutual consultation between mothers and fathers in raising their children. And while the Quran in several places uh, mentions the importance of respect toward your parents, it always mentions them together. Your two parents, in Arabic, waladain. It's always your two parents, your two parents, your two parents uh, that are mentioned. And there's a, a very famous saying, a hadith um, uh, attributed to the Prophet Muhammad. And a man came to him and said, uh, o Prophet of God, to whom do I owe the most? And the Prophet said, well, to your mother. And he said, yeah, yeah, after my mother, you know, uh, everyone forgets about the mother. Uh, after my mother, to whom do I owe the most? And the Prophet said, your mother. And he said, right. And after my mother, the Prophet said, your mother. And after my mother, and then the Prophet said, your father. Right. Uh, so this, um, this sort of triple endorsement of the importance of mothers uh, over fathers, I think, is very um, important. Uh, at the same time, it's important to recognize that mother, you know, the, the position of motherhood is not the only reason why women uh, were, were validated. The Quran does not present, although Islamic culture certainly would say this, but the, the Quran itself doesn't present um, children as being the primary purpose of marriage. The primary purpose of marriage is to have a relationship of, of love and mercy and comfort between two people. All right, um, uh, very quickly then one other thing is to talk about, since I mentioned this hadith of the Prophet, is to talk about the role of uh, women in the Prophet's life. So the Prophet Muhammad, as I said, was born into this kind of hyper patriarchal, tribal, uh, culture in Arabia, where it was all fighting, women were completely devalued, and so on. And in this culture, what was really important to your social status were your fathers and your brothers and your sons, those key paternal relatives. The Prophet Muhammad doesn't have a brother, he doesn't, ha he doesn't have any brothers, he doesn't have a father, and he doesn't have sons. Right? His father dies while he's still in the womb, he has no brothers, and the only sons he had uh, died either in infancy or in very, very young childhood. Which means that except for some uncles who did play, in, some of them anyway, played an important role in his life, the prophet's closest family relations were his wives and his daughters. And the tradition continually represents Muhammad as being publicly, demonstrably affectionate and loving toward his uh, daughters, and uh, according to the standards of his time, his, his companions often complained that he was overly indulgent toward his wives. Um, it's well known that the Prophet Muhammad had multiple wives, that at the time of his death, he had nine wives. It's fairly well known that one of those wives was a very young girl, someone we would consider in our culture to be a child, uh, really, and too young for marriage, uh, his wife Aisha, who was nine when he marries her. What is much less well known is that the prophet lived the overwhelming majority of his life in a monogamous relationship, a monogamous marriage with a woman who was 15 years older than him. He marries his first wife, Khadija, when he's 25 and she's 40. He has a loving wife, a uh, very loving uh, and happy life with her. He first becomes a prophet and starts receiving revelation while he's married to her. She becomes the first person to believe in him even before he believes in himself. When he receives the first revelation, he says, I, I think maybe I'm possessed by jinn or something, or I'm going crazy, I don't know. And she says to him, no, no, I know you're not going crazy, right? So in many ways, she's the first person to believe in him and support him. Um, she's the only wife with whom he has children uh, that live to adulthood. And he's married to her for 28 years. It's only when Khadija dies, when Muhammad is 53 years old, 
that he begins to take additional wives. So from 25 to 53, um, I'd say the good years, but uh, I don't think that's necessarily the case because I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to the good years soon. Um, uh, but uh, during, those, uh, during those years, he was married monogamously to one woman who was older than him when he did take additional wives uh, after the death of his first wife. Um, besides Aisha, who was very young, he also married two women who were older than him, another woman who was about the same age as him, and a couple of women in their 40s. Uh, as well as uh, one uh, or two uh, women who were under 30 years old. So um, it's not that uh, he only married young girls. It's not that he uh, always loved to have a polygamous relationship. Uh, these are things that he did toward the end of his life. And with the exception of Aisha, the young girl who he marries at nine, um, all of the other women that Muhammad marries were either divorced or widowed women who had been married before. And in marrying these women, he essentially sets a precedent, which says there should be no stigma attached to marrying divorced women, to marrying widowed women, uh, because in, in, in fact, these were the majority of Muhammad's wives. OK, so um, and these wives play important roles in his life. I talked about the importance of his first wife. There are a number of crucial points in his mission, difficult points in his mission, where he turns to his wives uh, or individual women among his wives, not just for comfort, but also for advice. And there are times when they gave him very sound, uh, important advice that, that, that changed, in some senses, the course of history for this early community. Uh, there were women amongst the earliest converts. Uh, uh, many of them defied their families uh, to follow the prophet, and they continued to play very active roles um, in the community. All right, so um, women were continued to be active even after beyond the time of the prophet to some extent, although uh, um, like many religious communities, it's true of Christianity as well. Women are there at the beginning, and then as things get institutionalized, women kind of get pushed uh, to the background a bit. Okay, so I want to talk uh, a little bit about what it means for a woman to be in the public sphere um, in Islam, right? Um, the, the prophet's wives, um, as well as many of the women in the early community, were there and present at battles, at, at community discussions, and so on. And to some extent, that continues. Uh, but this is often predicated on the importance of modesty, right? The importance of the idea of modesty, which uh, is a primary subject of both Fatima Mernisi's book and Leila Ahmed's book um, in the, the Muslim Bookshelf uh, collection. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what the Quran says about modesty. Okay. Um, oh, first of all, yes, let me <laughs> show this picture. Uh, this is an artist rendition, I want to just say, of the mosque in Medina, where the Prophet lived uh, the last 10 years of his life. Um, and I think if this pointer works, I can show you, um, that uh, all around the mosque, built into the mosque, were these small um, apartments, which is where his wives uh, lived. Muhammad did not have his own house, so to speak. Each house uh, belonged to one of his wives, and he would rotate uh, one night uh, with each wife, right? And this, this becomes in Islamic law a standard for equitable treatment uh, in part, not in total, in part in, uh, in Islam. All right. Okay. So um, this is one of the things uh, that the Quran says about modesty and about dress. When we talk about modesty, even in our own culture, I think there tends to be a double standard. Um, for men to be modest and to be chaste is often a kind of active thing, right? Whereas women is more passive, right? So men are not supposed to look or God forbid touch, right? And, and, and women aren't supposed to reveal this kind of active passive thing. But when we look at what the Quran says, we see that it enjoins both active and passive modesty on men and women. Right? And even though female modesty gets a lot of coverage, uh, in the Muslim world, if you go to the Muslim world, you'll see that men tend to dress a lot more conservatively than men do here. You don't see a whole lot of men walking around in shorts and uh, tank tops and things like that. Right? They tend to dress more conservatively as well. So in this 24th chapter of the Quran, it says, tell the believing men to lower their gaze and guard their private parts, so the active and passive uh, modesty. That is purer for them. And tell the believing women to lower their gaze and guard their private parts. 
Right? So if we stop there, it's, it's the same injunction. But then, of course, it goes on and gives us uh, some more detail about female modesty. So, um, right, so they should guard their private parts. So tell them, tell the women to lower their gaze and guard their private parts and not to reveal their adornments, except that which is apparent, and to draw their headscarves over their bosoms and not to reveal their adornments to any but their husbands, fathers, husbands, fathers, and I won't go through all of those, we take, take a long time, um, and let them not stamp their feet so as to reveal what they hide of their adornments. All right. As I said, the Quran is very well known for ambiguous language. In fact, it says that at the very beginning of one of, its, one of the chapters of the Quran. It says there is ambiguous language in this text. Um, what are their adornments? We're women, we have lots of adornments, right? Uh, so, uh, so, so it's, yeah, so it's typically understood, certainly in context, um, to mean hair. Uh, yes, to mean physical bodily features, um, sometimes even to mean jewelry. The word itself can mean any of those things, right? It particularly means jewelry, right? So it's metaphorical. Uh, so it leaves, and again, um, except what is apparent. It's only apparent if you show it, right? So um, my point is, I think this is very important. Uh, my point is that uh, this is a, uh, most Muslim women um, understand this to mean that they should cover their hair among other things. But it does leave a lot of room and a lot of flexibility, right, in terms of interpreting exactly what that means. Um, and it tells them to draw their headscarves using this Arabic word khumr, which means literally headscarves. Uh, but it tells, it to, tells them to draw it over their, their bosoms. And remember, we're talking about Arabia here, where even men cover their heads, right? Uh, so, because of the sun. So, it, it, um, uh, some people might argue that uh, it's assuming a head covering and saying you might want to make sure that it also covers your, uh, your chest. Okay. Uh, nonetheless, most women understand this to mean that they should wear uh, uh, something that covers their hair. And I'll give you some examples right, of different ways. There are many, many other ways. Um, there are probably 600 million ways uh, that this can be interpreted, right, for each woman. But, um, but you can see there are different ways that this has been um, understood. Uh, sometimes it can be a very simple uh, scarf. Sometimes it can be very ornate. Um, sometimes there's a concern to make sure every part of the hair is covered. Sometimes um, that's not necessarily the case. When I said when Islam went to various parts of the world, it adapted itself to the culture there. So we see uh, up here a woman uh, from India. One of the things when Muslims came to India, they found women wearing saris. Uh, women didn't entirely change their dress. They just changed the way they wore their saris. So instead of the loose end of the cloth just going over their shoulders, sometimes they would just pull it loosely over their head. And that was considered significant or, or, or uh, sufficient, I should say. Uh, here we have two women um, who are wearing uh, what will be, what, what, what are headscarves, right? Um, if they were to pray, they would put those scarves over their heads. All Muslim women cover their heads when they pray. But they, you see they've taken their headscarves and they've drawn them over their bosoms. Right? They've draped them over their uh, bosoms. And this is uh, one way, it, very common in the subcontinent, in Pakistan, and in India, uh, one common way for women to dress modestly, maybe one interpretation of that particular chronic uh, verse. And the, the headscarf, uh, certainly in its modern incarnation, is something that is often completely compatible with other forms of Western dress, right? So um, women will often wear, especially in the West, will wear a headscarf with what would otherwise be ordinary uh, Western dress. And as you can see, it's no bar to participation uh, in life in any way, and not even to sports, right? So here we have uh, some women who have been able to participate in sports. Many of you know in the last Olympics, there were several Muslim women who participated from various countries. In some cases, um, rules having to be changed about the kind of clothing you could wear um, when competing, right? Uh, oops, sorry, I'll go back. Um, hit the wrong button. This, of course, is um, a, a Muslim swimsuit. 
And I had a very good friend in graduate school who was Egyptian. And she wore a swimsuit like this when she would go to the pool uh, at Princeton and, and swim. And one day she went and she left her bathing suit there. And she told me, Maria, you know, it was the funniest thing because I had to call up the, you know, the, the recreational center and say, you know, I left my swimsuit there. And they said, oh, all right, we'll look for it. Is it one piece or a two piece? And she's like, well, actually it's a four piece. <laughs> And she said, dead silence on the other end of the phone. OK. Uh, but anyway, as you can see, this is something, um, obviously, that is or certainly can be compatible uh, with all kinds of activities. And, and women have been very, Muslim women are very good about doing that. Uh, there are two other verses, though, to mention. I'll, uh, oops, that part of that's covered there. Um, this is a, a, a verse from uh, Surah 33, verse 33. Sorry, chapter 33. Uh, it says, O prophet, tell your wives and your daughters and the women of the believers to draw their cloaks over their bodies. That way they will be known and not harassed. And I think that's significant for a couple of reasons. First of all, here it's not talking about headscarves. It's talking about wearing clothing that's loose enough that your uh, the features of your body would not be apparent. Um, one of the classical ways that this is manifested would be in, for example, this type of dress, which is very common in Iran or Shiite parts of Iraq, which is called the chador. And uh, in addition to wearing a headscarf, um, the women, this is a very, sort of very large, open, uh, sheet-like cloth that they would pull over their heads and either hold under their uh, chin or sometimes um, pin to the sides of their headscarf to um, really the word shador in Farsi or in Persian means tent and it's literally to almost create uh, the idea of being out, uh, inside when you're outside, right? Almost creating a tent uh, around yourself. Uh, again, not all Muslim women dress like that, but that, that would be maybe one very literal interpretation of this particular Quranic verse. And the, the Quranic verse also interestingly gives us a reason, right, why women should do this. It says, so that they will be known and not harassed. So the understanding is they'll be known as women who are modest and chaste and, chaste and of good uh, moral values, and so uh, therefore men would not harass them, right? It's, so it, it's telling us two things. Number one, that the purpose is to avoid harassment for women. Uh, and also that it should be a dress that marks them within their society as, peop uh, uh, as women of particularly high moral character and chastity. Right. Um, after the, the terrorist bombings in London, the 7-7 seven, seven bombings in London in the, uh, on the tube, there were a number of anti-Muslim incidents and hate crimes that took place. And of course, um, women who are dressed in an obviously Muslim way, wearing hijab, wearing a head covering, would be particularly vulnerable because they would be particularly visible as members of the Muslim community. And, uh, and one particular uh, Muslim authority in, in England, not all of them, but one, uh, actually said, you know, while this situation is going on, women who are wearing headscarves, maybe you can take them off because the purpose of wearing the headscarves is to avoid harassment and in this very specific kind of context, it might actually engender uh, harassment, right? So again, that importance of the purpose, the Quran often usually gives somewhere a reason for its particular ruling and, um, and Muslims tend to take that reasoning very seriously. Okay. Uh, the final thing the Qur'an uh, says about um, covering or modesty for women is addressed very specifically to and about the Prophet's wives, coming from the same uh, surah, and this is embedded in a larger discussion about those characteristics of the Prophet's wives that make them unique from other women. For example, that they're not supposed to remarry uh, after the, the, the Prophet dies. Right? Um, and here it says, O you who believe, enter not the prophet's houses, obviously where his, women, his wives would be, uh, unless permission is granted to you for a meal. And when you ask his wives for anything, ask them from behind a veil. This is the word hijab in Arabic that's used generally for the head covering. Uh, that is purer for your hearts and for their hearts. Right. Um, after this particular verse was revealed, 
Muhammad asked his daughters and his wives specifically, not all of the women in the community, to cover themselves completely. That is not just to cover their hair, but to also cover their faces, right? parts of their faces as you see. Uh, again, different interpretations of that here. Right? Uh, but again, it's quite clear that this was directed at the wives of the prophet and Islamic law does not make covering the face required for other women. Nonetheless, obviously, being like the wife of the prophet was a good thing to be. And so gradually over time, certainly by the medieval period, if we, what we read in literary sources about the Islamic world suggests that um, most women, particularly women who were of upper class or middle you know, class women, would uh, likely have covered themselves completely, including covering their faces. Uh, that starts to go away toward the end of the 19th century, late 19th century, early 20th century. Uh, most uh, Muslim women begin to remove the face veil, just keeping uh, the head covering, although, as we know, there are still places and still women who continue to cover uh, completely in this way. And these are three different interpretations. Obviously, the one at the bottom is the burqa, the complete sort of uh, covering where there's just a screen or a mesh uh, covering so that no one from the outside can see in, but but to some extent they can see out. Okay, so these are the three basic three scriptural bases of modesty and particularly of veiling uh, in Islam. Uh, veiling was already a common custom in the area, certainly when Muslims, um, and Layla Ahmed makes a very good point about this in her other book, um, Women and Gender in Islam, when Muslims move out of Arabia and they go into the Fertile Crescent in Egypt, in Iraq, in Iran, and so on, uh, veiling of women is, is certainly middle class and up women is common, right? It's, it's just what one does. Okay. So uh, the example of the wives of the prophet, the pre-existing culture meant that veiling became uh, ubiquitous or almost ubiquitous. We have a few cases in sources where it'll say things like, um, you know, some woman was very distraught and so she went outside without her veil on and her, you know, disheveled her hair and things like that. But uh, um, th that's something that's done in an unusual case. Okay, so. Um, uh, one of the big arguments then becomes um, um, how, how do we read or understand the veil uh, when Muslims start to encounter uh, 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 Westerners in particular in the 19th century and the 20th century, the veil becomes a very politicized uh, thing, right? And there's a big debate about is the veil something that's empowering? Is the veil something that's oppressive? I think it depends on the veil. I think it depends on the context. Um, I, I think there are a lot of factors uh, that are involved. But certainly, uh, there are a lot of um, women who, and certainly as women become more public, um, take a bigger role in the public sphere, they've become advocates for themselves. And a lot of female Muslim advocates uh, for themselves and for their rights will be arguing for their rights within the context of Islam, but a lot of them are also arguing specifically for their right to live as they wish to live, to dress as they wish to dress. And these are just a few examples of these kinds of uh, things, right? Um, on top, hijab, my dignity, my right, my life. Uh, hijab, of course, re referring to the head covering most commonly. Uh, I like the one, uh, the, the British one, keep calm and dress with dignity. Uh, the, um, the headscarf is, is fre frequently glossed as dignity, as a form of dignity, again, um, linking those two uh, concepts. Um, and uh, Allah raises your dignity, again, this term dignity, very, very common in connection with the veil, uh, through the hijab. When a strange man looks at you, he respects you because he sees that you respect yourself. And so these kinds of messages uh, increasingly increasingly common uh, uh, among Muslim women. Um, and uh, the, the question then becomes, um, uh, once women dress modestly and uh, there's an acceptance of them in the public sphere, uh, what is the possibility of them attaining pos important positions, positions of authority? Uh, you know, in many parts of the Muslim world, including in Tehran, women are, make up a majority of college students, right? Um, the percentage of college students in Tehran, 65%. Uh, female. So women are certainly um, playing important roles in society and moving up in terms of their the authoritative positions that they have. 
so up here you, you see, of course, some faces you might recognize. Benazir Bhutto, unfortunately assassinated a few years ago, but Prime Minister of Pakistan. Um, uh, Sheikh Hasina, who's the Prime Minister of Bangladesh. Um, Khanuma Abtakar, who's a vice president, um, essentially like a minister, a minister or a cabinet secretary in Iran. Uh, Ingrid Batson, the first female head of the Islamic Society of North America, huge organization of Muslims. Uh, and here, uh, this woman is Amina Wadud. She's an American, African-American Muslim uh, convert to Islam who attempted in 2005 to do what no other woman has done, which is to, as a woman, lead a mixed gender prayer. Women can lead other women in prayer, but if it's all men or if it's mixed gender, the, the person who's leading the prayer uh, should be a man. But here, uh, this is not widely accepted in the Muslim community, but she's kind of opened a door, and I think it's important to, um, to acknowledge that. Okay. Um, uh, again, uh, some other important uh, women. This is Amina Wadud again here, Esma Barlas, two uh, feminist scholars, Muslim feminist scholars who've written important influential works on the Quran and, and, and what it says about women. Uh, and just uh, before I open it up to questions, I just quickly will show you this, just for a little bit of fun uh, at the end. Um, there is a new uh, female superhero that Marvel Comics is releasing. I don't know in exactly in what extent she is Muslim. There is a kind of scarf around her neck, I can see, but um, we have to see. That's, it, that's just been announced. Uh, up here, uh, this is a billboard that, um, it, there's a lot of these very inspirational billboards around. You've probably seen them as you drive on the highway occasionally. This one just debuted in Southern California. Uh, and um, again, about um, overcoming differences and being together, which is its slogan, its hashtag. Um, and ap apparently, I'm told this is a real couple, that they really are a, a, a couple, right? These two, it's not just a publicity stunt. Um, anyway, the other three come from an interesting series that my kids love, actually, and it's called The 99. Uh, and it's a comic superhero series cartoon that was developed by a man in Qatar, and it's based on the fact that the Quran identifies 99 names and qualities attributed to God. Uh, and, uh, and so all of the characters are named after one of these 99 uh, names. And as you can see, there's a number of both male and female superheroes. And what I love about this uh, is that you have a whole variety of Muslim female superheroes, right? We have uh, some that wear this kind of a scarf, some that wear that kind of a scarf, some that don't wear any scarf, some that wear uh, the full face covering, uh, and they're all, um, they, they all work together for, for uh, peace and truth and justice, uh, and it's, it's really an entertaining series. So uh, even popular culture is catching on. So I'll stop there um, and see if you have any questions. Please, my question concerns the Sharia. Yes. I want to know if the Sharia is a legal punishment in the, all the country, the Muslim countries. Um, Sharia, of course, as you know, refers to, um, in general, the, the, the um, body of Islamic laws and rituals that Muslims follow. And in the let's see, 44 Muslim majority countries, most of them do not continue to practice the corporal Sharia punishments that you know are mentioned in, in the Quran. So in Iran, uh, in Saudi Arabia, uh, now in Nigeria, um, and, and a couple other places, but uh, for the most part, no, those particular uh, punishments are, are something that most Muslim countries no longer use. They still consider the crimes that were associated, of course, with those punishments to be very serious crimes. Um, so, for example, adultery. Um, it may not be punished with capital punishment anymore, but in many Muslim-majority countries it does remain a crime, right, for which you can be criminally um, prosecuted. But yes, those particular punishments tend no longer to be practiced in most Muslim-majority countries. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hi, I just want to say thank you once more uh, sure. for coming. My question uh, deals with, I guess, sexual harassment. Yes. So in our culture and in our society, we kind of um, focus on don't get raped rather than don't rape. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, the text that you provided uh, was that way they will be known and not harassed in terms of modesty. Do you mm -hmm. think that kind of encourages um, blame to be put on the victim? Um, it certainly could be read that way, absolutely. And uh, there, you know, the idea that women are responsible to some extent for the sexual crimes that are perpetrated against them, uh, I think is to one extent or another a double standard that we have everywhere, unfortunately. But yes, the idea that uh, dressing modestly might uh, help uh, prevent that, it doesn't always. Muslim women will talk about this, that you know, even though they might be completely uh, uh, dressed, in fact, there was a, an interesting documentary, this man from Cairo, he was a man, right? He dressed in a full sort of burqa type uh, hijab, so you couldn't even tell he was a man, and he was getting followed in the street, you know, and he was like, this is unbelievable, right? Uh, so, um, so it doesn't, we know that it doesn't actually work to prevent sexual harassment, and you're right, the fact that it's presented in that way could be understood uh, to, to, to mean that. That's right, is yeah. It, is it usually taken that way, or? Because you said that, that the text is, is, is read as, as something literal and not um, with metaphors. So I'm wondering, is that kind of, have you seen in instances where people actually quote the text and say that she kind of deserved this because she wasn't? I haven't seen instances like that. I would, I would assume that it would be something that would be more implicit uh, and a kind of maybe a, an understanding rather than something that is, uh, that is, but as you know, this is a serious problem with us now. The the, the question of rapes on campus and, you know, should women, um, you know, should there be a message, women don't get drunk so that you don't, you know, get raped. So, uh, unfortunately, I, I think this tends to, to be pretty pervasive. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you for coming out and speaking to us. My, my question is, when I saw the woman, you know, she was leading a prayer. I've mm -hmm. never really seen mm -hmm. anything like that before in my life. Right. Um, do you know where in the Quran or the, any of the hadiths where it mentions, you know, about women leading prayer? Um, there are some texts about women leading prayer, um, but they're not general. They're sort of very specific contexts. But when Amina Wadu did this, and again, it was very controversial, when Amina Wadu did this, um, these textual sources were things she and others drew on as, as justification for what she did. So for example, there was a famous uh, companion of the prophet, Um Waraka, and she was one of his companions from the very beginning, and she was very devoted, and when the prophet was going out uh, to battle, she said, I want to come with you, you know? And, and he said to her, no, you stay home, you lead your family in prayer. And obviously there were both men and women in her family. So this is an example where the prophet very clearly, everyone agrees that this was, you know, that he actually said this, uh, that where he actually uh, designated a woman to lead her mixed gender family in prayer. But as you know, that's a different thing than in public, let's say in a mosque, leading a mixed gender prayer. But that was one of the things that they drew upon. Then in the second uh, Islamic century, the, the great founder of the Islamic school of law, a Shafi'i, the founder of the Shafi'i school of law, lived in Egypt. And there was a woman in Egypt who was a descendant of the prophet, a great, great, great granddaughter of the prophet. And she had a reputation for tremendous learning and scholarship and knowledge uh, and also piety. And when Shafi was on his deathbed, he said, I don't want anyone to say the funeral prayer for me except for Sayyidina Nafisa, who was this woman. And she indeed led the funeral prayer for this great founder of the Shafi Islamic school of law. But as you probably know, the funeral prayer is said standing up. It's not said um, um, with the, the, the act of bowing and prostration. So, if we just go back to the picture for a minute, uh, one of the, there's nothing in the Quran that says women can't lead prayer. And this was a big problem because when, um, when, when Muslim scholars wanted to condemn her for what she had done, they actually couldn't find anything that said women shouldn't lead prayer because apparently no one ever thought a woman would want to or would think to do it. And so they never actually made a law about it. So they couldn't actually find something. All they could find was something that said that the, the prayer leader should be the person who knows the Quran the best and who can recite the best and so on. So they couldn't find anything to justify it. But their, um, one of their arguments is that of course, 
During the Muslim prayer, uh, Muslims will make a full prostration on the floor, and some people argued that it didn't really seem seemly or certainly modest for women to be, um, you know, bending over and bowing down in this way with um, men behind them. Okay. So it was again, it came back to this issue of modesty. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you for coming out and speaking to us. Um, I have two questions. <clears throat> one is, uh, what gained your interest in Islam? Mm -hmm. And the second one is, is it true that the Arabic in Quran is from the olden times, so no matter how scholarly you are, it's hard to translate? Well, um, so for the first question, isn't this interesting? Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, um, I became interested in, um, in Islam because I, I grew up uh, not really knowing anything about Islam. Um, there weren't any Muslims in my community where I grew up in a small little community in Connecticut. Uh, but when I went to, I spent a year abroad in Oxford University as an undergraduate and they said to me, oh, you're an American, you really need to know something about the Middle East. Um, and I said, well, I'm not interested in the Middle East. You know, I'm, I'm here to learn about European parliamentary systems, you know? And they said, oh, no, 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 no. You know, you need to learn something objective about the Middle East, you American. So anyway, they, they, they sent me to this class and, um, and, and, and I found it fascinating. I found it really, really interesting. In fact, the, and the most interesting part to me was um, precisely how powerful Islam was. Uh, as something that shapes people's lives and consciousness still in, in the Islamic world. And so that drew my interest. And from there, I began studying the Islamic Revolution in Iran. I found that very fascinating. That was the first major world event that I remember as a child was the, the, the taking over of the US Embassy in 1979. And, um, and so that drew my interest in Islam. Uh, the Arabic of the Quran is very difficult. Um, it is, yes, it is a very old form of Arabic. It's quite different in some ways from modern standard Arabic, but not certainly not impossible. Someone who knows modern standard Arabic, it would be a bit like, let's say, um, someone who speaks modern English trying to read Shakespeare. There's going to be some strange turns of phrase. There's going to be some words that you don't quite understand or words that mean one thing today that meant something a little bit different to Shakespeare. But you'd be able to figure out generally what was going on. And so it is very, it, the, the language is very difficult. It's also very beautiful. But yes, quite distinct from modern standard Arabic. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for coming out. Sure. I wanted to know, can women be imams? Can women be what? I'm sorry? Imams? Imams? Well, the word imam can mean simply prayer leader. And so as I just said, it's quite, most Muslims would say no, that w women can't lead uh, men in prayer. However, women can be imam, but they don't, not usually given that title, but the word imam can also be used to mean someone who's very knowledgeable in the religion, who's a real scholar of the religion. So the famous... Uh, Muslim uh, uh, scholar, theologian, um, Ghazali, is referred to as Imam al-Ghazali. So the title Imam, or it would be Imama, uh, is not usually given to women. However, there are women who have been able to attain a degree of religious knowledge, scholarly knowledge of Islam, such that they do become authorities, right? So you have um, women who, let's say, in, in Iran and in Egypt, who became very authoritative commentators on the Quran. You have uh, women who become scholars and experts in the law. And now in certain parts of the Muslim world, like Indonesia and in Morocco, they're actually creating a kind of core of female muftis, right? People who give legal opinions. And they realized this was really necessary because a lot of times women have a, a, a question about ritual or about law and they might feel embarrassed because it might deal with a personal matter or a marital matter and they might feel embarrassed going to a male legal scholar and so they're training uh, women with real expertise in Islamic law so that they can actually issue a fatwa legal opinion for other women in certain cases. Okay, okay. thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for coming out tonight. Um, I was just wondering about like women compared to 20 years ago and how they are now in the, the Islamic society. Like, what are some ways that they've like 
made more profound impacts on the religion as itself? Like what ways have they mm. sort of come out from being behind men? Mm -hmm. Right, as I said, um, you might have to go back even a little further than 20 years. And the, the situation of women, as I said, it varies a great deal, you know, depending on political situation. So you, you know, I mean, if you take Iran in 1979, prior to that, uh, women were um, you know, very prominent, or well, not very prominent, but had pro some prominent roles in society, and they uh, were very free and very Western sorts of laws, and certainly Western sorts of dress, and so on. And then suddenly, 1979 comes, the revolution. Uh, even though women participated in the revolution, initially at least, Khomeini, the Ayatollah Khomeini, says, "Oh, women should all go back to their." houses and they, they shouldn't participate in society in this way anymore. Uh, eventually that doesn't happen. Now you have women there, right? But, um, but these things tend to fluctuate. But I would say in the last 20 years, what's really important is you have a growing number of women who are becoming scholars, becoming knowledgeable in their own religious tradition. And so people like uh, Amina Wadud or Asma Barlas, um, Aziz El Hibri, who's also based locally, runs a very important organization for Muslim women. Uh, they're, they're really becoming experts in their own tradition. And so they can begin, and they're really very strongly starting to say, hey, wait a minute, you know, um, there are things in the Quran that, that you're, you know, that we're supposed, the rights in the Quran that we're supposed to be given, and you know what, you really haven't always given them to us, you know, and uh, really being aware of, of questions of justice, of questions of the application of the law, and being able to challenge these kinds of things. And certainly, Initially, when women started to do this very vocally in the early 90s, both in North America, eventually it spreads to, to other uh, Muslim countries as well, or to Muslim countries. I don't want to say that America is a Muslim country. Um, the, uh, you know, initially, there's a lot of there was a lot of hostility toward them uh, on both sides, right? Western feminists saying, you know, why are you calling yourself an Islamic feminist? If you really want to be a feminist, just give up this whole Islam thing. It's hopeless and, and, and follow us. Uh, and a lot of very conservative, traditional Muslims saying, oh, you're just a feminist, you're a lackey of the West, you, you know. And so it was very difficult, but these women persevered, and in fact, they have opened a conversation. And so now, wherever you go in the Islamic world, um, leaders feel, at the very least, the necessity to pay lip service to the idea of the importance of women's rights. And that may not seem like very much, but I think when you open a door like that, it's very hard to close. And I do see things continually moving forward. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you for coming, doctor. Mm -hmm. um, my question is regarding what's going on right now in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. Women are currently fighting to get their driving rights. Mm. And given the fact that Mecca is in Saudi Arabia and that Mecca mm -hmm. plays a crucial influencing factor in the Islamic world. Mm -hmm. Is there a fear that by allowing women, if Saudi Arabia particularly was to allow women to drive, that will be opening Pandora's box and hence allowing like... Saudi Arabia is really the only place where that box is closed. <laughs> um, the uh, the situation of women driving in Saudi Arabia is quite interesting because, in fact, there's no law saying women can't drive in Saudi Arabia, as you may know. Um, it's just um, so discouraged by the kind of religious police that they have women actually being stopped if they drive and things like that, and then they're brought down to the police office, the police department, and their fathers or their husbands or whatever have to bail them out. But there's technically no law they can be charged with. So. Um, but, but certainly uh, Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, I believe, are the only places where women literally can't uh, drive. Every other part of the Muslim world, uh, they, they do indeed drive. And, um, and it's interesting because, you know, in Arabia, women rode horses and they rode camels, which is the equivalent of a car today. But somehow there's something about a car uh, in Saudi Arabia. But I should say that in general, um, Saudi Arabia continues to very strictly enforce something that is not really strictly enforced anywhere else in the Islamic world, which is this idea uh, of sometimes it's called walaya or wakala, which is male guardianship of women. So that in traditional times, ideally women shouldn't travel and go you know, far outside of their neighborhood without 
their husbands knowing without permission of their husbands, right? This idea that they were the protectors and maintainers of women, so they needed to guard them and protect them. Um, most Muslim women don't do this um, today, but in Saudi Arabia, this is still taken very, very seriously. And I have a student from Saudi Arabia who told me that you know when she drives from one province to the next in Saudi Arabia, one city to the next in Saudi Arabia, her husband automatically gets a text message saying, did you know that your wife just crossed the border, you know? And her husband's like, you know, really, you're cluttering up my <laughs> phone here with this. But, uh, but uh, again, uh, there's, we also have to be careful of, of the ways in which modern technology can actually, you know, allow some of these things that couldn't really be monitored in any kind of serious way before to be implemented. So, but again, Saudi Arabia is a very unique case. Two quick quest questions. Have you ever worn the burqa? And the second question is, can you talk about heaven from the, um, from the Quranic texts? Can I talk about what? Heaven. Heaven. I haven't been there. Um, <laughs> but I'll tell you what I've heard. Um, no, uh, with, with regard to the first question, no, I haven't worn the burqa. I, ha I did live in Iran um, for, uh, for a year doing research, so I did wear the chador uh, that you saw, the, the, the tent thing, um, and I wore that. You, you don't have to wear that, of course, everywhere in Iran, but uh, some of the research that I was doing were, was in these sort of seminary libraries in these sacred centers, and there I, I felt that would really stand out if I didn't wear it. Um, I have tremendous respect for the women who wear it every day because I could, it was all I could do to keep it on me. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, but in any case, so yes, I have uh, worn that um, in Iran. In Iran, as you know, you're required to, to uh, cover yourself at least in some way, right? At least with a veil. Um, heaven. Uh, the uh, Quran is probably, of, of the three monotheistic scriptures, it is absolutely the most descriptive in terms of what heaven or paradise will be like after you die. Um, if you've read it, any of those descriptions, you know they tend to be very physical descriptions. They tend to be, some people would say, very sensuous descriptions. So it's uh, described as a garden with lush foliage, with continuous fruit, um, with, uh, there's four rivers in paradise, as there's four rivers in Eden in the Bible too, but the four rivers in paradise are identified in the Quran as a river of pure water, a river of pure milk, a river of pure honey, and a river of pure wine. So um, even though uh, Muslims aren't supposed to drink wine here, there's wine in paradise. Although it says, it's the kind of wine that doesn't make your head spin. So one of my Muslim students once said to me in class, oh, you mean I'm doing all of this just so I can go to heaven and drink grape juice? Like, I don't think so. So uh, in any case, but, the, um, but so it, it's described in this way. Of course, um, it, it's very famously described as having uh, these very um, pure, almost ethereal women uh, that are there as well, and um, um, but it's you know it's interesting. I the, it's very clearly these female women. They're not described um, you know uh, doing sexual things, right? They're not described in a very sexual way, but they are described as very beautiful. Um, but one of the things I often say is that what the Quran. Uh, pictures the people in paradise doing, including with these beautiful women, is sitting across from each other and talking. So men get to paradise and there's all these beautiful women, but for eternity they have to just sit there and talk to them. That's it, just long conversation. Um, so yes, um, it is, and one of the, but, but, but in all uh, honesty, the, the, one of the critiques that has been leveled against the Quran was leveled already from the medieval Christian period was that it describes a paradise that's too physical, that's too sensual, that's not detached enough, that's not spiritual enough, right? Um, and it certainly is described in that, that way. And there was a debate in Islam itself about whether these descriptions of paradise were meant to be understood literally or metaphorically. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. It was very interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you for the effort, you know. Sure. I, you know, it's very hard. <laughs> I'm coming from the culture country, so mm -hmm. from the uh, Arabic countries too. Yes. Uh, I have two comments. Uh, mm -hmm. First, uh, it's about 
uh, Prophet Muhammad, who mm. married Aisha, nine years old. Mm -hmm. As you know, there is two, uh, there is few uh, schools for interpretation of the Quran, and there is, uh, you know, there is ex oh, extreme uh, uh, school too. Mm -hmm. So, I think the last uh, too many Imma agrees he married Aisha when she was fourteen or fifteen. Because the extreme uh, school, they mm. want to use this excuse mm. so they can get the girls now to marry at nine years old. Mm. This is the first one. Yeah. Can I? <laughs> yeah, second? sure. I'll just try to keep <clears throat> it in mind. Yeah. Yeah. And the second one is regarding the hijab. Mm. And uh, also, there is too many study about it. Uh, there is too many interpretation to Quran too, mm -hmm. and uh, there is too many fact uh, factors to the hijab. Mm. There is uh, economic, some political, and if you take, I think there is too many study in Egypt and North Africa. Mm. It's regarding this too. Yes, I just uh, I want to clarify that. Sure. Uh, just uh, I'll, I'll just give a couple of quick um, responses. Yeah, there are some people who uh, the, the the majority tradition says that um, that Aisha was uh, six when she became betrothed or engaged um, to the prophet and nine when she was literally married uh, to him. And the understanding being in Islamic law, women are not supposed to be married to men until they've reached puberty. And, and so that was the idea that she had reached puberty at nine and then it was decided she could marry uh, Muhammad. I know that there are people who say, no, she was betrothed at nine and married at 13 or something like that. Uh, that it's a possibility, I mean, no one really knows. People didn't really keep birth dates uh, back then. But in either case, she was young. She's young enough that we're told that, uh, that, that when she was married to the prophet, she says she reports that she was still playing with dolls and that the prophet would come and sit and play with her uh, as well, that he would sort of indulge her childhood in that way. But yes, there is, there is a concern about this. One of the things that's kind of interesting about this is that if you look, for example, at medieval critiques, and of course there were a lot of medieval Christian critiques of the prophet, they were very critical of him marrying lots of women and they were very critical of different aspects of his life. They weren't critical about this. They didn't say, gee, can you believe he married a nine-year-old girl? And this was because it wasn't uncommon in the medieval in medieval Europe for women to get girls to get married at that age, right? Um, the you know our culture is a very different culture for sure, and you know there are some very strict Islamic countries that have on the books that nine is the minimum age of marriage because of of Aisha, and sadly. There are some parts, particularly tribal parts uh, of the world, where, where girls are being married at that very young age. But most, uh, certainly, urban centers uh, in the Islamic world, you know, don't ch girls don't get married at nine most commonly. Um, but yeah, it is a concern. Uh, and secondly, yes, there are a lot of political issues with the the hijab. It goes in and out. It has also social repercussions. Um, Technically, in Islamic law, there isn't slavery anymore in the Islamic world, but when there was, um, uh, technically, even slave women who were Muslim were not supposed to wear, were not supposed to cover their heads. So there was a social component to it as well, for sure. And um, as you know, I don't know if you're from Egypt, but uh, yeah, I, I thought maybe from your accent. Uh, but as you know, if you went to Egypt in the 1960s, you would see um, women dressing, all walking around dressing like Jackie Kennedy. You can see it for yourself. You go to a copy of Egyptian newspaper El Ahram from the 1960s. You don't see any women wearing hijab. All women are dressed in very Western dress. You would never see that today if you went to El Ahram, uh, the, to the newspaper. And uh, Leila Ahmed talks about that. So uh, there are political reasons and, yes, social and economic reasons for hijab. It's a very complicated uh, subject. Thank you for your comments. Uh, hello. My, my question actually sparked when you mentioned that you lived in Iran. Yes. Uh, I'm just curious if you have seen the movie, Now Without My Daughter. I know of the movie. No, I haven't yeah. seen it. Yeah. It's basically an um, American family. The husband is from Iran, and mm -hmm. he decided to take his family for vacation in Iran. Upon getting there, he takes advantage of all the, you know, women having no rights or anything. And he says, we can't go back. And she had to escape to Turkey and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, they later kidding. reunited, you know. 
Did they? Well, yeah. I, <laughs> I, I just thought I would point I that just, out. There's yeah, <laughs> I saw the movie last year, so I don't know much about yeah. it. But um, yeah. I'm just curious how the state is now concerning women in Iran or just anywhere in the Middle East or any of the Muslim, uh, Islamic countries. Yeah. Uh, again, it's um, it, it's going to vary to a, a great extent. Like I said, you will see certainly women um, in positions of authority. You'll see women um, working very good jobs as doctors, as bankers, as managers, and so on in Iran. Um, but you know, they're you know, the women are still required to dress in a particular kind of way. You still have. Uh, marriage laws that are very strictly according to the Sharia. One of the things I should mention is that Sharia law, of course, is very broad. And someone had asked me about Sharia uh, corporal punishments in the Sharia. And those are, as I said, in most Muslim countries, not practiced anymore. And there are lots of aspects of Islamic law that are not necessarily practiced even in Muslim majority countries. Family law tends to really stick. And so uh, certainly, um, the you know, depending on what kind of a situation arises, you could have a situation where, um, uh, and, and there are situations where women are treated very unjustly under particular interpretations of those laws. But, um, y you know, I didn't have any problems when I was there. The women I knew um, didn't have any problems. Um, there's still issues about traveling. You know, uh, I, I went there by myself initially. My husband joined me later. He was in school. And so I went there by myself, and I couldn't really travel. Not that they wouldn't let me travel. Of course they would, because, you know, I was American. Uh, but they, um, you know, I wanted to travel with other women that I had met there, and they couldn't travel without traveling with one of their male relatives, for example, right? Uh, and, you know, one time, at one point, I did have to stay in a hotel when I first got there by myself, and it was just the strangest thing for a woman to be staying alone in a hotel room, you know? And uh, I didn't quite get this. You know, I walked in, and everyone was very nice to me, and I went up to my room, and I got to the hotel. I had been traveling, and I thought, oh, you know, I really just want to go to bed. You know, I'm so tired. I laid down on the bed, and the phone rang. Miss Maria, Miss Maria, are you all right? Is everything all right? Is everything all right? Yes, everything is fine. Thank you for checking. The room is lovely. I'm going to go to sleep now, you know. And I hung up, and 15 minutes later, the phone rings again. Miss Maria, Maria, Miss Maria, is everything all right? You know, they were so concerned about what would happen with me <laughs> in this room. And I thought, well, I'd really like to just take the phone off the hook because I'm afraid they're going to do this all night long, but then they're going to wonder what's going on. So I didn't. Uh, but um, so I really, I mean, in that sense, it can be limiting, right? I, I, could, I couldn't travel. Um, unless I wanted to travel alone, which I didn't feel comfortable doing, uh, until my husband came, right? Because other women weren't allowed to travel without a, a male relative. So, yeah. So, I mean, there are there certainly are limitations. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I was basically just wondering about, like, with marriage, like, are they still arranged marriages? Like, do women actually have a say in who they are going to marry? That's a really good question. Um, arranged marriages are, yes, still uh, quite common in, in the Islamic world. Of course, it's breaking down a little bit because you have men and women going to college. They're in co-ed classes, you know, so it's more like, you know, you tell your sister to tell your parents that you're really interested in this boy in your math class or something, right? Like, so there's a little bit of finagling. There probably always was uh, historically. But, um, but yes, there still are arranged marriages. And this, this is important not only for women, but also for men. So um, both for men and women, marriage is really a family affair. And so it would be, it would be extremely difficult uh, for a man to marry someone even that his family didn't like or, di or disapproved of in some way. It would really be difficult uh, for him. But in principle, in Islamic law, it's not in the Quran, but in Islamic law, for uh, if a woman has never been married before, then she needs the approval of her guardian in order to marry, who is usually her father. And if her father's not alive, it might be an uncle or an adult, adult brother or something like that. Uh, if the woman has been married before and she's either divorced or widowed, she doesn't need um, someone to, uh, a guardian to, to sign for her. And the principle behind that, of course, was protection, right? The understanding being, let's say, 
you know, a young girl who hasn't had much experience with boys or with men is not necessarily going to be in a good position to know who's going to make her happy and her parents, assuming they have her best interest at heart and so on and so forth, right, will we'll, we'll have that power to, to approve of her marriage. But also, and this unfortunately is a right that women have that does not always, um, often does not get recognized but, or observed, but no woman can be forced into marriage according to Islamic law. So even if um, a woman's never been married before and her father says, I want you to marry this person, uh, and she says no, technically they can't be married. And, and there was a case where a woman was married against her will by her father during the time of Muhammad, during the time he was alive, and she came, the woman came and complained to Muhammad about this, and he said, your marriage is invalid. You know, if you continue, this, this is essentially going to be fornication, right? This is an illegitimate marriage. Uh, but unfortunately, that doesn't always tend to be the case, and it tends to be, it tends to conflict sometimes with this really important point of obeying your parents and respecting your parents. And so if your father says, I want you to marry this person, even if you have the right to say no technically, you can also feel guilty about saying no and so on. So it's a very tricky issue, but, um, but thank you for bringing that up. It's very important. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being a wonderful audience.